All right, so today is going to be uh, an introduction to what we know as uh, federated learning and it's a very hot topic in uh, distributed machine learning and in general uh, if you want to train a single neural network model based on data that's distributed across millions of workers or millions of servers. So a typical example would be, uh, so your, if you use like let's say an Android phone, so essentially your Gboard or your uh, any like Samsung keyboard or uh, Android keyboard. Uh, so the idea is, so as you type something, right, the next word, and you basically, I mean, start suggesting you the next word, right? So it, I mean, and it depends. It really depends on how people use their keyboards, and the, basically, the next best prediction would be modeled accordingly. So how do you think such kind of uh, models are trained? So let's say this is this is a snapshot of uh, Gboard from Google. So how do you think such kind of models are trained? So it has to be, first of all, like let's say Google wants to roll out something, right? It has to be uh, a single model that has to be rolled out across all devices, right? So, so the question is how do we, like when we have data distributed across so many workers, so here we are talking about training neural networks on edge devices like mobile phones or IoT devices, which may not have the uh, luxury of having like uh, enormous GPUs to work with, right? So so far we had looked at decentralized SGD or parameter server approach, where uh, you had few clients or servers working on their private data set. They were computing gradients on their own data, and then uh, either they were like if it was decentralized SGD, so there was no centralized server. So essentially they were doing some kind of gossip algorithm to ensure that. And the parameters of their neural, neural network or the model converge to the same value. But then, uh, the, there, I mean, you still assume that there are few, maybe tens or hundreds of such workers. The moment you start having thousands or millions of such workers or clients, the challenge is uh, how do you in real time get information from so many different agents? And that becomes uh, practically infeasible, right? So, in that regard, federated learning was sort of uh, devised to essentially work with uh, training of neural networks on edge devices. And that is what we are going to look at it today. So when we say edge devices, so essentially you have, uh, what do we mean by edge devices? So cell phones or your IoT devices. So essentially that, that basically have contain a lot, lot of uh, uh, devices, collect huge amounts of data, right? That can be informative for So when we say huge amount of data, so every, like every user, basically they have their own picture, so their own uh, text to work with, right? So everyone is just accumulating a huge amount of data or also creating a huge amount of data. And whatever model that needs to be deployed, it, es it essentially should try to derive common features across all different edge devices. And such a model would be uh, very informative, right? Because in, I mean, that would be largely applicable to a broad audience. So for instance, as I, I think at, towards the beginning of this course, I'd mentioned that like uh, ITB uses this uh, lingo that I mean, you guys add max to a lot of words, right? Infimax, Coolmax, and things like that. So if you have a lot of ITB users, uh, just start typing like this and eventually spread out to the rest of the world and you continue to use the same lingo, eventually you would see that uh, that kind of thing also starts popping up uh, when in, in the Gboard as well. So even though everyone's data is highly heterogeneous, uh, it, it's, it's private and so on, most of the training uh, is, or mo basically most of the feature that uh, essentially, I mean, the two different uh, individuals may share. So essentially, this learning happens on uh, common features between different agents or different workers, right? I mean, there are these edge cases, uh, which I mean, as we train the neural network, right, there will always be outliers and we don't try and fit to those outliers. So essentially, you would see that if uh, once, I mean, if once you're communicating with a lot of IoT users or a lot of cell phone users, you're trying to essentially learn those common features that connect these different and that's that's how the Gboard or any other uh, prediction models are based on. Okay. 
So that's an aside thing, but uh, why do we have QWERTY keyboards and not keyboards which have ABCD and so on? It's, it's, it's an aside thing, but like what would be the reason why people uh, decided to work with this kind of keyboard? If you, if, if you remember at like, at, I think Micromax at one point had launched this uh, phone with ABCD keypad instead of QWERTY keypad. I mean, eventually Micro, Micromax didn't last, so, but yeah. No, that's, that's not really the reason. So, before we had this uh, electronic revolution, all keyboards used to be mechanical keyboards. Uh, so, the typewriters used to be mechanical typewriters. And the problem with mechanical typewriters is they, have, they were based on hydraulics. So, essentially, if you start typing too fast, in fact, you can see, show that like if you start having ABCD instead of QWERTY, like you can have a better typing speed. But if you start typing too fast, it will result in paper jams. So, they arrange it in such a manner so that like it's generally not possible to type too fast and once people like once uh, the society transitioned to these electronic keyboards, the teachers or the ones who were teaching uh, typewriting, they were the ones who were trained on those QWERTY keyboard. So, it kind of uh, got, I mean the same sort of trend kind of got translated to the digital revolution as well and, and even the digital keyboards are now QWERTY keyboards. So, it has no, I mean. This has been designed so that you are not too efficient, okay. So, when we say about training data, so, so what would be your training data on edge device like cell phones? So, what every user types on their phone? Okay. So again, to start with, we have millions of edge clients. Essentially, we are talking about cell phones and these tiny edge devices. And the question is, how can one utilize the parameter server framework? Something that we have already looked at, right? So, just to re uh, recap, what was parameter server framework? So, you had a centralized uh, server. So, parameter server. And there are these workers, right? So, let us call them workers W1, W2 and so on. Wn. So, everyone has their own private data. So, let us call these data, data sets D1, D2, Dn and so on, right. And in the parameter server approach, the idea was that the parameter server would broadcast and let us let's say Tth iteration, it would broadcast the weights Wt. So, these servers on their private data set, they would end up computing the gradients on their own data set and let us say they would they would communicate delta wt1, essentially the gradient information, right? This would communicate delta wt2 and so on, delta wtn. And then these, uh, and then the parameter server would perform this update, which is wt plus 1 is wt minus uh, some step size times, uh, let us say k equal 1 through n delta w t ok. So, this this is this was the parameter server approach. So, what are some problems with this particular strategy? Can you think of certain uh, potential issues with this particular strategy? Synchronization of updates. Synchronization of updates is one thing. So, so the biggest challenge that you see uh, let us again uh, you have to look at this particular point right. So, there are millions of edge clients. So, if you are have millions of edge clients, that means you have enormously huge data and for the parameter server, it has to wait for information from so many edge devices and it has to actually uh, have huge communication bandwidth. So, so when we talk about in terms of uh, so parameter server, um, approach uh, requires in fact, prohibitively large, large communication bandwidth, right? Because you are working, and that is because we have we are working with millions of edge devices. So you have to have that much bandwidth to be able to communicate with that many edge devices, right? Communication bandwidth. 
since it exchanges information with millions of edge devices. What is the other issue with this? So, while I mean that may not directly be the case, you can show that. So, another concern is data privacy. And even though you are not directly sharing your data, in certain cases you can sh show that if even if you are sharing your gradient information to a parameter server or a centralized server, just by looking at the gradient information and looking at your own state, there is a way to estimate the kind of data that, that a user may have. So, you can try and recreate. So, there are, there are some data privacy and sen sensitivity concerns. So, sensitive information is another concern. And what is the third issue? So, these edge devices may have limited internet connectivity, right? So, to be able to communicate with your centralized server, you would need a good internet connectivity at all times, right? Because it is waiting to receive data from all the devices or all the users and all the users need to be connected to internet to be able to communicate. Otherwise, this would just keep on waiting for data from all the users and only when it receives data from all the users, then it can think of performing the update, right? So, uh, so edge devices may have limited internet connectivity. Okay, so to account for this, federated learning uh, was sort of devised as a as a framework to be able to perform uh, machine learning at scale or distributed machine learning and at scale. And the key idea is uh, instead of uh, trying to train a neural network at a centralized server or a centralized location where you would need either access to all the information to start with, or you would require a complete like let's. The other solution is to have a completely centralized approach, right? Where all the data is uh, like all users' private data is stored at a centralized way, and the centralized server basically looks at those data points and then performs like a, and trains a single neural network model. So this, either this, or you have a parameter server approach where you wait to communicate uh, with all the uh, users or all the agents or all the clients uh, in each iteration, right? And that basically places a huge communication bandwidth requirement. So, parameters, uh, this federated learning was a, uh, I mean basically was devised to essentially elevate these issues and the sort of key idea is you instead bring the training to the uh, edge, well not data, but devices. Essentially you bring the training to edge devices and we will we'll, uh, look at how federated learning works, but it is somewhere hybrid between a centralized like a parameter server kind of approach but there is some some level of randomness also involved and this was in the seminal paper by McMahon et al from Google uh, in 2016. So, this is the title of the paper where they came up with this fed average algorithm, federated averaging. So, this is already used for uh, next word prediction uh, on android cell phones and the key idea is you only train the neural network. So, you only when it is basically I mean on your device on your edge device only when it is uh, basically plugged in for charging. So, essentially you do not drain the battery that way that you are always like you at the back end it is always training a neural network that it does not happen like that. So, a particular user or particular edge device is only involved uh, when it is plugged in for charging and it is only few MBs of data that is uh, used on your own uh, sort of cell phone and you are not using data from anywhere else. So, you are not communicating with any other edge device you are just I mean you are essentially cell phone is a standalone. Uh, uh, sort of trainer of a neural network and there is a nice sort of uh, uh, so Google came up with this nice federated learning comic strip that I, I think you guys should give a give a read. So, essentially it talks about what federated learning is and how it sort of came into picture. So, starts with someone coming in back from a conference enthusiastically having discovered a way to uh, maintain data privacy uh, 
but at the same time uh, being able to perform distributed machine learning and so it kind of starts at like the company the head the basically the head of the organization basically allocates few interns and then the interns they start listing some issues one by one and then this basically the main character then uh, basically talks about how these issues are kind of addressed in this federated learning framework so you should give it a read for so, so one of the issues is the personal data or the sensitivity of the information and so there are these uh, different aspects and eventually it talks about how federated learning works uh, there is also uh, basically encryption to ensure that whenever data is basically being sent from user to a centralized sort of uh, server essentially it is properly encrypted so no one can actually reconstruct the data and so on. So all of these edge devices uh, the data is encrypted and it basically goes here and it in such a manner basically the data is masked so, it, it, so that it is basically a zero sum mask. So essentially you perturb the data in or shuffle the data in such a manner so that on an average everything is uh, basically kept intact. So these masks basically exactly cancel out and so on and eventually uh, basically it talks about how federated learning kind of works. So should give it a read uh, it is a nice comic strip. So the idea is you have a central server and the central server broadcasts its current set of weights let us say you are training a neural, single neural network right and it broadcasts the current uh, model parameters to uh, the different edge devices. So instead of doing this with all the edge devices it would select a fraction of edge device at a time. So it, it won't do it for all the edge devices in one go it would select a fraction of the edge devices and it would, it would relay the information about the current parameters. So let us say this information xt or the current set of weights are being shared. Now on this uh, let us say model 1 or the, or, or the device 1 what happens is essentially device 1 receives those current uh, this parameter values or the values of the weights and they start training the neural network on their own uh, on their own private data for certain let us say few epochs. So tau i number of epochs. or basically it performs tau i number of local updates. So essentially it trains a neural network based on the parameters that it has received or the based on the current, current, current set of weights that it has received it basically starts training its uh, a neural network on its own private data uh, for certain number of epochs. So essentially you perform you essentially perform uh, gradient descent multiple times locally and let us say it ends up getting a weight let us call it xt1. Similarly uh, the other device would uh, do the same thing xt2, xt3 and so on and then this particular let us say there are k devices involved this particular information is then propagated back uh, to the centralized server. So at the outset it almost looks like the decentralized approach or SDD or the or the parameter server approach but the key idea is we do not work with all the clients or all the edge devices we only select a handful of those and we do not perform a single round of uh, stochastic gradient descent and then share the gradients or basically in the parameter server approach what was happening is you give the current set of weights I will perform a single uh, single round of update on my data set and I will basically give my gradient estimate like essentially average gradient value send it back to the parameter server or the centralized server. In this case you perform multiple rounds of uh, updates okay on your own data you perform multiple rounds of update and then you have send the updated parameters to the centralized server. And this is done only for a uh, handful of devices not for all devices because not all devices are going to be for, for instance plugged in for charging at all times right. So only a handful of devices are selected randomly. Uh, and this update is performed and uh, and eventually because the devices are being selected at random so it would like everyone's like let us say at, at some point you would be uh, basically at some point you I mean your own phone will be picked up right because the, uh, every every edge device has an equally likely uh, probability of being selected right so because it is being selected at random. So this is how so it is not like your data will never be used uh, for training so that is not going to be the case. But then as I said because you are averaging over a lot of devices so only the common patterns or the common features are going to get sort of uh, captured uh, 
and it's not like your uh, let's say you prefer to use a particular lingo that not every everyone else around you uses so that you wouldn't expect this to be picked up by neural network because it will be treated as an outlier okay so this is the idea so if we compare decentralized sgd or even let's say parameter server approach with federated learning so what is the difference in terms of number of workers or servers or clients that the both the algorithms need or both the approaches need so with parameter server at a time as i said uh, we cannot work with millions of devices right uh, so usually when we talk about parameter server or decentralized sgd So when we talk about tens or at best hundreds of clients, whereas when we talk about federated learning, we really talk about a huge scale, so essentially millions of clients, so that's one difference. What about availability of workers, do we, in case of parameter server, do we require the workers to be available at all times? Yes, right. So we assume that we are going to be receiving information from every every worker involved. So again in parameter server. We require the workers to be available at all times. In predator learning, I mean that's not needed, right? So these work with a handful of clients, right? Work with a handful of clients. What about data distribution? So remember the uh, decentralized SGD theorem that we had looked at. So there was this uh, B square term that was on the data like heterogeneity or the non id data right. So essentially more or less you want the data heterogeneity to be somewhat bounded. So with parameter server or decentralized SGD we require that the data is roughly homogeneous. I mean it may not be id but you, we require the data to be roughly homogeneous for it to work efficiently right. So essentially the data that is distributed across different devices or different uh, clients we require them to be roughly homogeneous. So if you are talking about let us say classification of handwritten digits uh, from 0 through 9 so there are these 10 classes. Uh, so you would require that all these 10 different classes are equal roughly I mean equally distributed across it may not be the same image but uh, you will have maybe equal roughly equal number of zeros and ones and twos and threes and so on right. So, so we require the data. roughly homogeneous with federated learning uh, you can work with really heterogeneous data right because since we are talking about edge devices you have very I mean you, you are going to have your own personal data a lot of personal data is going to be there right. So the data distribution is going to be highly heterogeneous. What about types of workers? So essentially when we talk about the compute requirements of different clients uh, in parameter server or the decentralized SGD, do we require them to be homogeneous or heterogeneous? So usually they, I mean when we talk about when you think of a parameter server approach always think of uh, as let us say uh, maybe a GPU enabled device at one particular location right. So there are multiple such locations and they are interacting with each, with each other. So, so essentially uh, in parameter server approach uh, the type of the clients are largely homogeneous in terms of computer uh, compute power right. So 
with federated learning when we say edge devices you can have a very powerful cell phone or someone can work with their own tabs so you have different types of edge devices you have different types of iot devices right so the devices or the clients are also going to be heterogeneous what about privacy so essentially uh, while uh, at least with parameters decentralized sdd there is no information sharing with the centralized server you are still communicating with your neighbors and as i said you can potentially use gradients to estimate uh, the data distribution that one particular agent has so so i would say that data distribution can be rearranged since that you can try and estimate what other uh, in federated learning data is private so and secure so you want you do not want to exchange your own private data with your neighbors or a centralized server and so on and as as we saw in that comic uh, data is usually encrypted when it goes to the server so within federated learning there are these two different uh, terms that are often used one is uh, cross device versus cross silo kind of federated learning so when we say cross device it is the the usual use case of federated learning when we have uh, like different edge devices like cell phones so it it's basically you are using different devices uh, like a cell phones or some other edge devices to essentially maybe train a single model so that would be cross device federated learning cross silo federated learning is when you use uh, instead of devices when we talk about different entities so let's say there's a hospital or there's a bank or there's some other firm and so on and they have their own let's say a server right a server room or something like that right and they where they use their own different types of data like a hospital would use a different completely different type of data right than a bank for instance but then again like you want to train a single model based on these different heterogeneous data distributions so these are not edge devices particularly may or may not be edge devices anymore you have more sort of a again as i said like it can be a server room so you can have a gpu enabled device for instance so more homogeneous uh, uh, sort of compute devices uh, as compared to the cross device federated learning so this kind of uh, federated learning is called cross silo federated learning so where you have these different organizations uh, that that are involved and not the uh, individual edge devices okay so again if we if we look at the distinction between these uh, cross device and cross silo in terms of the number of devices obviously you are going to have uh, more like in cross device you will have more number of devices as compared to uh, cross silos right so so this is again in the range of tens to hundreds whereas this would be in the range of few millions right what about availability of workers since we are talking about federated learning in both cases unlike this particular case where we had for parameter server or decentralized sdd we required the workers to be available at all times since you are performing federated learning i mean they'll have the same requirements that you do not expect all of them to be available at all times right data heterogeneity again it's going to be heterogeneous in both the scenarios whether it's cross silo or cross device so data is going to be data distribution is heterogeneous so this is again a slight departure from the parameter server approach where we require the data to be somewhat homogeneous right worker types so in worker types cross silo would have more homogeneous workers as compared to cross device which is which is going to have more heterogeneous workers so cross we'll have 
homogeneous focus and cross device would be heterogeneous. And privacy constraints, it is the same privacy constraint. So, you you assume that the data is private and secure. So, that apply because both are, are again part of federated learning. So, we still have the same privacy constraint. So, data is private and secure. So, again this is again going to be a slight departure from decentralized SGD. So, we are going to use certain notations. So, the first thing is the total number of workers or total number of clients that are going. So, workers, clients, agents, so all these terms would be used interchangeably. In certain cases, I mean you can also think of it as devices and so on. So, we assume that there are total of, uh, I mean total such number of clients is k out of which we would like at a time in each communication round only c clients would be part like of basically it is a fraction of client that would be participating so that fraction is c. So, essentially c times k is the total number of clients that are going to be participating. So, as I said if in uh, federated learning let us say the current set of weights is x t and on this using these weights a model is trained on an edge device for uh, certain number of uh, certain number of rounds right. So, you perform multiple local updates on on the local data right. So, we are going we are going to assume that the mini batch size for this uh, model up, like updating the model weights that is going to be B capital B and that is going to be the same across all devices. Is this clear? Then number of stored data samples at, a, at the ith client so that is going to be n sub i. So, this would have like let us say n 1 number of points and 2 number of points n k number of points and so on ok. Then the learning rate is uh, we assume that it is going to be constant across all uh, devices. So, this is going to be eta. So, learning rate because these mo these uh, these devices themselves will be training neural networks. So, they would be using certain learning rate for these stochastic gradient descent algorithm and that is going to be eta and number of local epochs per client. So, what do we mean by local epochs? So, local epochs would be so, let us say you are using a batch size of capital B. So, one lo local epoch means that um, like uh, essentially uh, you have iterated over the entire data set using a batch size of B that is one local epoch. So, how many total local epochs you would be performing per client that is going to be capital E. So, that means you have iterated over the entire batch uh, entire data set capital E times ok. So, if that is the uh, so, if let us say E is the total number of uh, local epochs capital B is the batch size and n sub i is the total number of data points per client or the, for let us say client i. So, how many local updates will be performed at client i? So, what is tau? So, we call this tau i. What is this tau sub i equal to? So, again what is the definition of local epoch? One local epoch means that you have iterated over the entire data set once using a batch size of b. So, if n sub i is the number of data points, so n i by b is the total number of uh, updates per local epoch right and you have e number of total so this is e times ok. So, this is what tau i is equal to. Is everyone with me on this? So, the total number of uh, local updates. So, a local update would mean like let us say I give you a batch and you use that batch to update the weights. So, how many such local updates are being performed? So, that is going to be equal to how many times you iterate over the entire data set of n n i points using a batch size of capital B times the total number of local epochs which is capital E. So, this is going to be tau sub i. Is this clear to everyone? Yes. 